Right. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Knowledge Rights 21 webinar. How do we fix ebook markets? Um, a trying to read my own writing, <laughs> a discussion on the future of libraries and authorship. So, uh, a couple of housekeeping rules. The hashtag today is hashtag ebook SOS, which I think is what's sitting behind Caroline. So please tweet hashtag ebook SOS. Um, and today, as you can see, is being recorded. So uh, um, please, please bear that in mind. So I will now attempt to share my screen. Um, can you see can you see my presentation yes yeah thank you uh so i think today is actually our fourth webinar um please keep an eye out on our website knowledge rights 21 um as to upcoming webinars our next webinar should be on uh, open copyright norms so we have four uh absolutely uh wonderful speakers today the dream team i think for this discussion we have Cahill McCauley, who's president of the Library Association of Ireland, as well as being a uh, university librarian at Maynooth. We have Caroline Ball, who, amongst other things, is co-founder of the eBook SOS campaign, an academic librarian at the University of Derby and trustee of Wikimedia UK. We are, have Mikkel Christofferson, who is chief consultant at Copenhagen Libraries and um, for those of you not fortunate enough to be born Danish, probably are not aware, but Denmark has a library run ebook platform, which Mikkel will uh, talk to us about. And last but absolutely not least, of course, is Dave Hansen, who is executive director of the Authors Alliance. Uh, a US-based organization, but with European members. And of course, US authors do not only publish in the US, but publish internationally. So again, highly relevant for, for our discussion today on ebooks. So a very brief infomercial. Uh, we are Knowledge Rights 21. We are funded by the Arcadia Foundation. And our goal is to advocate on uh, a pro-research copyright environment in Europe. So in particular, our particular areas of policy are ebooks, uh, contracts and technological protection measures undermining flexibilities in copyright law, secondary publishing rights, rights retention, as well as uh, the, I think, um, and also what is the topic of our next conversation and webinar in January, which is open norms. Um, so more fle a more flexible approach to copyright law. Uh, we have national coordinators in a number of countries if you look at our website, you can see where they are from. So off the top of my head, head UK, Bulgaria, Latvia, um, Poland, the Balkan region, and very soon, I think, Greece and Italy as well. So again, please check out our national coordinators who are working on our advocacy programme across Europe. Uh, there's our website and uh please follow us on Twitter. So I will now stop sharing so we can move to the, the substance of today. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have a sort of a free ranging conversation on on the issue of ebooks. Uh, amongst the panelists, but also, of course, extend that to the audience. So if you go onto chat, there should be a Q and A button, um, and you can post uh, questions 
there. So uh, my colleague Stephen, who's from the International Federation of Library Associations, will be sort of mediating the chat box and and uh, either while we're discussing, saying here's, here's a pertinent question um, for the for the panelists, uh, and then certainly at the end we will we will open it up to the floor. So. So I guess with no sort of further ado, then um, I've introduced the panelists, um, and I would like everyone to very briefly, uh, or, or to the extent that you feel appropriate, just explain how you, as individuals and representatives, also of your institutions, have have are experiencing are experiencing, I guess, the reality of ebook markets as 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 we are today. So I'll just go across the top of my screens, uh, which starts with, um, so if we go Caroline, Cahill, Mikkel and Dave, um, if you could just talk a little bit about your personal and institutional experience of ebook markets. Yeah, okay, so I'll go first. Um, so yeah, my name's Caroline Ball. Um, by, by day, I am a, a mild-mannered, unassuming academic librarian. Um, and by night, I am an ebook SOS activist. Um, and that, that kind of being an academic librarian is really about how I got into ebooks. You know, my experience has been very much on the kind of cold face um, in terms of, you know, that experience of needing to find books, needing to find ebooks, not being able to supply them to staff and students that are requesting them, you know, being presented with ebooks where I'm lucky if there's maybe two books on there that are ebooks, um, you know, being faced with spending ages, you know, sorting through different licenses, different pricing levels. You know, running up against this ebook is not available in your country. You know, this ebook is only available on a on a subscription model. So, my experience was very much running into these frustrations around ebooks pretty much every single day of my working life, um, and that is what really led um, me to get involved with with Johanna and Rachel and kind of start ebook SOS. Really, um, just getting absolutely fed up and thinking this this cannot be the best way for this market to operate. This cannot be. The best way for all these barriers to be in in the way of of you know librarians like myself just trying to provide resources to staff and students um and that that kind of constant frustration is really what's what's led me into this whole movement really thank you Cahal. thanks ben and good afternoon everyone so my name is Cahal mccauley and as ben said i'm the university librarian at maynooth university and i'm also the president of the Library Association of Ireland. And I guess those two hats are important because uh, like Caroline, as an academic librarian, I guess I've seen um, ebooks move over the last number of years from you know a, a small but important part of our collection to um, the stage where we now have more ebooks than uh, print books in our collection. Um, and, and, and they're now an essential part of our collection. Obviously in the last few, uh, few number of years with COVID and the issues around physical access to libraries, how important they were to allow us to continue to support our students. But um, also at the same time and not unrelated, obviously, um, the realization that this increase in reliance on ebooks and the uh, long standing issues with them were becoming more and more significant as um, our reliance on them increased uh, to the point where it really um, is becoming unsustainable. And as a senior manager, I had to do something about it. It would behold me. Um, but then also as president of the Library Association of Ireland, this is a cross, cross sectoral issue. So um, we work very closely with our, our public library colleagues as well. And this is a massive issue with them. Over 40% of, of uh, uh, e-books in the public library collection have some sort of restrictions placed on them by the suppliers. And um, for that reason as loan, it was a very important and attractive issue for the LEI because it is something that cuts across all of the uh, issues. And we issued a content statement in October 2020 summarising our concerns. And I guess around that time, shortly beforehand, Caroline and Johanna and our colleagues, Rachel and so on, had, had started a campaign in, in the UK. And we very quickly linked up with them and we're very fortunate to work with them quite closely now over the last number of years. And particularly in Ireland, I would say, since the start of this year, when I guess the campaign has become more formal and we now have a steering group and so on. And we're working through a, a work programme to try and um, address all of these various issues. And that's what led me to participate in seminars like today's. Thank you. I think I mean, that's that's uh, personally, I find that extraordinary you, that you said you had more ebooks in in your collection than paper books. I mean, that really does speak to the importance, I think, of of ensuring that ebooks ebook markets develop in a far more sustainable uh, fashion that they than they appear to have done to date certainly in English language uh, markets 
Um, so next we have have Mikkel, um, who I think will talk to us from the perspective of the public library sector. Yes, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, English is not my first language, which will uh, become painfully evident very shortly. Uh, I am with uh, something called the Association of uh, the Digital Public Library of Denmark, which is internationally speaking a sort of a unique um, construction where all Danish municipalities, all 98 of them, uh, along with Greenland, um, Greenland, the uh, Faroe Islands and the northern region of Germany has come together and this association uh, runs uh, everything citizen directed IT in the public libraries including our national ebook and audiobook platform called Ereo. Don't try and say that. Um, it's it's the ebook case uh, in English. And we've had that since 2011. And I've so, been- uh, Book case or court case? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been involved with, the, uh, with it for over 10 years now. And since 2017 as the chief negotiator for the, for the libraries. So we, we run our own, we do our own negotiations and we also run our own uh, front ends. Um, and I am, I, I'm also the um, I'm also the chair of NAPL Forum, the European Library Associations, uh, um, no, the European Library Authorities Association. They have an ebook working group which I chair, and and have done so for a couple of years. And I've noticed that not only do public libraries and academic libraries look nothing alike, also the public libraries in the individual countries look nothing alike. So. Um, I'm 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 extremely interested in how we're going to fix this uh, this afternoon. But but an afternoon well spent. I'm very thrilled. So, Mikkel, can I just te tease out what you've said there, um, and and sort of say it in a slightly different way in terms of my understanding? So so I think the the platform Eriolan uh, essentially is is sort of a a, fr a front end a wrapper from. And then behind the scenes are the ebooks coming off the servers of publishers, but the interface is 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 a public library interface. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure that's completely correct. Uh, Denmark is small enough that all publishers use the same uh, third party vendor, and they put everything digital uh, for the market on there, and then it goes to streaming services, uh, ebook stores, and the library and. And that's where we get uh, all our titles. But then the rest of it, we have sort of designed and built ourselves. Um, but, so the front end is yours and it's the apps. Yes, yes. Web a, apps. A, a single aggregator, perhaps yeah. for want of a better word. OK, thank you very much. Uh, so now now turning to Dave at the Authors Alliance, very interested to hear your your members sort of views i guess from a public library perspective and also an academic library perspective yeah thanks ben um so hi all i'm dave hansen from the authors alliance uh i'll drop the link here in the chat you can find us uh authors alliance our mission is to support authors who write for the public benefit um and so our authors uh our members which are about 2500 or so um, really care about having their works read, uh, having them accessible, um, it, it kind of broadly construed. And that's not to say that they're not interested in, you know, earning a living. Some of them uh, really do rely on uh, licensing fees and royalties from uh, from their books. But um, the the main reason that they're writing is not that. Um, and so uh, our interest, Authors Alliance, interest in this is. Um, to uh, break down these barriers that are being erected primarily by publishers without a whole lot of author input uh, to, to ease up on some of the problems that we see with ebook licensing. Um, and I guess I'll say a bit more about my personal perspective on this because I've seen it from multiple angles. Um, before Authors Alliance, I uh, was the lead copyright and information policy officer and also a associate university librarian at Duke University um, responsible for all of our collections as well as support of scholarly authors. And so in that role, I saw the same issues that all of you are seeing in terms of you know, publishers either refusing to deal um, or having horrific licensing terms 
um, or uh, and not just even on the things that we kind of highlight as the the mainline issues, but you know strange things like refusing to promise that their ebooks are accessible, um, which is just baffling to me. Um, so uh, so I've seen it from that side, um, but then also supporting authors. Uh, who are primarily writing because they want the world to learn from their work. And um, the, the biggest thing that I have seen from authors on this is uh, that they're really unaware of what's happening with their books. They assume that publishers are acting in good faith. And of course, they'll sell their books to libraries um, and are really shocked when they find out what's happening with this market. Um, and so, so that's one big thing. And then the other, um, part of this with our, our authors is they, you know, want some say in how their books are distributed, um, and they want them available to libraries. Uh, but most of the standard publishing contracts don't give them that, um, and they have very little negotiating power to insist that, you know, a, a major publisher will promise to to sell their ebook uh, to libraries on reasonable terms. I maybe maybe Stephen can put in 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 the chat one of our previous blogs um blogs webinars uh included by Barbara Schleihagen who is president of the German Library Association and she uh spoke again to the point that authors are not well informed actually or the majority of them are not particularly well informed on a how libraries work and in Europe of course that means royalties for for loans back to authors through public libraries and in Germany through academic libraries also so um that authors themselves were, were not not you know understandably uh very aware of of how ebooks end up in in libraries and financially what this this means for them as well so yeah um interesting so so now i i move, moving to sort of perhaps playing devil's advocate and we've kind of answered the question all already um you know coming from an academic perspective surely the the majority of uh of of up-to-date current learning comes in the form of articles this is why in the open access world we've seen such a focus on articles um do do ebooks matter i shall throw does anyone really care about ebooks other than us who us who are here today? And if, or why? Perhaps another way of asking that question is why should they care? I think I might throw my hat in the ring initially for that one, um, which is I think particularly you know a lot of my work is about supporting undergraduate students, um, and and I think books, ebooks, textbooks really matter for undergraduate students. You know, we we focus a lot on the academic journal articles and obviously they are really, really important for students. But I think, you know, the thing that often gets forgotten in the talk of kind of journal articles is that journal articles are written for experts. You know, they're written by experts and they're written for other experts. So they are not easy introductions. They are not, you know, very sort of conducive to learning about a subject you know when you have students that are really at the beginning of their exploration of a particular discipline or a particular subject you know they need texts that are aimed at kind of easing them into that discipline and explaining concepts and contextualizing things um, and this doesn't happen in journal articles because you know a journal article is is written for um, another expert you know I often say particularly to law students you know these articles are written for practicing lawyers they are not going to explain concepts to you they are going to assume that you know that already um, and I think that kind of gets forgotten a lot when we're talking about academia particularly, and that's where textbooks particularly are so vital for students because it helps them contextualize what they are reading in those academic journal articles. It gives them that kind of introductory explanation so that they've get, then got that background knowledge to be able to understand what they're reading in these kind of research level texts with the journal articles. So I think, you know, when you are talking about supporting students, as, as I do in my role, textbooks still have an, an enormous place. And that is what I say to students, you know, go to books to get that understanding, go to books to get that background information, that beginning information, and then build on that with journal articles. 
But if we don't have those books, if we can't get those textbooks, you know, students go straight into journal articles and they're lost, you know, and that can have an enormous impact on their learning if they're, they're kind of thrown at, at resources that are pitched at too high a level for them mm. before they've got that grounding. And, and so I think, you know, particularly with undergraduate students and, you know, the bulk of people at university are undergraduate students, you know, that's that's where the bulk of the money is um, it's hugely important. And it's where our students go to first. I can see Carl's got his his hand up. Yeah, I'm happy to come in there as well, Ben. But I guess a few more uh, practical points as well about why ebooks are important. I mean, as a, as a, as a, as a library manager, they offer many advantages. So, for example, in terms of another great pressure we're under in terms of our costs is in relation to real estate and buildings and so on, and um, growing demand and uh, expenses around providing space. They offer great opportunity there, and closely related to that, of course, is the increasing emphasis on um, uh, sustainability and uh, green issues uh, so they ha offer many many advantages there and of course very importantly another you know issue that is, is rightly becoming even more important now uh, on campuses and indeed across libraries uh, generally is the whole area of equality diversity inclusivity and there are many people for whom print books um, are not accessible uh, for various reasons and ebooks offer a wonderful uh, route for them and of course in the past you're working in libraries long enough and we used to have to create um, accessible versions of various print books and now obviously the more um, uh, uh, titles are available as ebooks then the less that we have to do and that's better and it's more inclusive um, of course the issue is that certainly in academia the availability levels are, are pretty fairly low uh, so that issue still persists but there is certainly a huge uh, potential, um, you know, in terms of ebooks, um, there are also very ne many negative reasons why they matter so much. I mean, we talked about the costs and the fact that they're taking up such a huge part of our budgets now. I mean, now over seventy percent of my non-pay budget goes on e-resources. Now that wouldn't all be ebooks, but it's uh, it, it would include ebooks. And um, um, the other issue, which I think doesn't get enough. Sorry, you know, Carl, what was that? Seventy percent of non-pay budget. My non-pay budget. Would go on e resources now, not just ebooks, but uh, e resources, oh. including ebooks. Um, and um, uh, there are, um, you know, we know about the issues around cost. I'm sure we'll talk about them more as we go on about cost and availability and licensing. But the other issue, I suppose, why ebooks matter and why I think we do need to think about them is um, there was a lot of work done initially um, uh, at the, uh, you know, when e readers and so on became more popular about the, the difference between intellectual engagement with print text and e text. And I will, I do think that's an important issue as well. I know, particularly in public libraries with um, uh, younger readers, that's an issue. Um, but I think it's also an issue in terms of some of the issues that, that Caroline touched on in terms of, you know, when a student is trying to get to grips with a new, a new topic and, uh, you know, a new area of research and so on. Um, I do think format is important as well. Thank you. Dave, I could see you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight a, a couple of things. One is um, on those uh, diversity and equity and inclusion matters. I think um, uh, from an author perspective, one of the great promises of being able to publish your book electronically is that you get um, global reach, uh, theoretically at least. Um, we know that that doesn't happen because of licensing structures and other things that get in the way. Uh, but from the author's perspective, if you really want your ideas to have the maximum reach and impact, you're not going to do that with just a print publication. Um, it's just impossible to, to engineer the um, worldwide distribution that you'd need for that. And that's what an ebook does for you, um, at least in theory. And that's actually, I think, also reflective of the big problem, which is we have this great opportunity and it's being squandered because we have um, a whole host of issues interfering with that from business interests to uh, legal issues. Um, and it's really preventing um, that, that maximum reach and impact. Uh, the, the other thing that I think is really important about eBooks is um, on that kind of negative side of uh, the ledger. Um, one of the big shifts that I think we've seen over the last 20 years has been um, effectively the end of library ownership. Uh, you know, we have a system with print books where we acquire, or libraries acquire a physical book, and then they have certain rights that are kind of balanced out in the law and um, determined through a democratic process so that 
uh, they can do certain things with those books, lend them out, um, and, and all sorts of other activities. But when you get to ebooks, um, what's effectively happened is a privatization of the law uh, and all of the terms of access and reuse and lending um, are all based on a private company's whim um, and what they say is allowed. And, and that's kind of an existential problem uh, in terms of access to information, but it's a particular problem uh, for libraries and the ebook marketplace that we see right now. And um, I, I think that that's uh, sort of the big elephant in the room issue is if this is the kind of system of information access that we're going to accede to, you know, we may not be able to, to do, uh, you know, research on works that were produced in this last 20 year time span, um, you know, 100 years from now, because it just doesn't exist. Um, libraries haven't been able to preserve it. Uh, the publishers don't care anymore. And it's just sort of disappeared into uh, the ether. And so that um, that's a, a really big problem, I think. Yeah, I, before moving to Mikkel, I just wanted to un underline, I think, you know, for me, whenever I talk about ebooks, I I feel that this the move from paper to a digital environment where, as you've said, the law has become privatized. What users, researchers, students, libraries can do with content is at the contractual and technological whim of of, of rights holders. You know, fundamentally undermines to you know to my way of thinking the public interest role of of a library, which is to acquire collections, preserve collections, and give access to those collections so so as you say you use the term an existential crisis I I I, I, I you know I I do think it is fundamentally as we, as with journals but this move to digi digital and therefore the privatization of access to knowledge does I think you know really does um create I think a, a a, cri a crisis, for ones of a very strong word, in the way that we think about equity of access to knowledge. Um, so, mo mo moving to to to, to Mikkel, I've heard um, some public librarians sort of say, raise the question. I don't know if it's playing dev 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 devil's advocate that, um, in a sense, e-books undermine libraries in the sense that people are not coming because they're using ebooks I, I don't know if that's something that you 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 were wanting to touch on Mikkel or whether your point was something else well if 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 you've heard that maybe it's because I've been saying it I mean okay <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't you I was thinking of but I was no, trying to wrap my brain whether it was you Mikkel, but, but, but to the to now. the former point of of of, of ebooks it's just um I mean, I, I started by saying that that public libraries and academic libraries are nothing like each other. We have different, uh, very different challenges, and I think this goes to show uh, one of those uh, major differences because uh, academic textbooks uh, cannot necessarily easily be substituted by another textbook. Right? So, uh, so you have to have that book, which gives the publisher enormous leverage. Uh, for a public library, uh, titles are a lot more substitutable, if that's a word. If it's not, it's it is now. Um, in the sense that people want, yeah, people want some some Nordic noir crime story, and they have one in in mind, but then they can't get to it, and they'll just pick up something else. Uh, it's not that I, I know there's only one like uh, where the crawdads sing, but but in, instead of having to put down 100, maybe 150 euros for a, for a textbook that your library can't. Uh, I can't provide you with you can you can check out a, a you can take out a commercial subscription service for 10 euros and it'll be there or you can pick it up at amazon uh, or pick something else i mean when we when we had this metered access or one copy one user model from harbor collins we introduced that in 2015 and our big publisher thought that when people realized they had to stand in line queue up for an ebook then they would go buy it uh which is not at all what happened what happened was that people realized i can't get to that and then they just checked out something else uh, Mikkel, I suppose one thing I think the audience would be very interested in is is the development of the Eriolan platform. 
that you you've sort of had ups and downs in terms of accessibility I don't I don't know if you want to just quickly explain to people your famine and feast is I think over dramatizing what's happened but definitely you've had ups and downs haven't you yeah I, well I've been referring to it as as, as ebook uh, war one and ebook war two so <laughs> feast and famine is not overly dramatic but um yeah the whole story is um is is, is interesting but it's also a, a, a 80 slide presentation I have so you should probably not get into that now so I can uh, so I can just do it it's been yeah, you just down. go like this. <laughs> no, and we started in two very quickly. We started in 2011 with all publishers. Then in 2012, they realized that Ireon uh, was cannibalizing on their sales, and they were absolutely correct. Uh, so they pulled out. Then they came back in 2015 uh, with uh, with this new compromise model of the biggest publisher could could now use metered access or one copy one user. Uh, that didn't work out the way they had hoped, so they pulled out again in 2016. And then they came back again in 2018. And at this point, the market had be, the Danish market had become big enough uh, that we could put Ereon at a, in a different place in the market than the commercial services. And so now publishers have uh, two very different sales channels here. One, what, there are things that are really uh, going well on Ereon on the library service, and there are things that are really moving in the commercial services. And they don't; those two streams don't uh, interfere with each other. So. Uh, I've been calling this the era of, of peace, love, and ebooks, uh, and it's a love affair based on income streams uh, more than my personal charms. I'm afraid. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure that's not the case. I would also, I there is no substitute um, for the Danish author Peter Hoog either. I would I would suggest you know, and if you don't know his works, definitely go and go and check them out. Um, let's. We've touched a few times so far on the issue of cost and and what this means for for, for budgets. Um, perhaps we'll loop back to you, Mikkel, because you had some fantastic um, projections on where this is taking the Danish public library um, budget that maybe we can we can wrap up with. I don't know, Cahill. Caroline, any any would you would you like to outline the kind of costing challenges that you're seeing in universities around access to ebooks? Yeah, Carol, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll give a very brief summary from. I mean, really, I'd have to say, you know, um, imitating what Caroline and colleagues did in 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 the UK. Um, uh, at, at around the start of our involvement campaign, we also gathered some examples um, locally of, of the differentiating uh, differentials. So ebooks were costing up to 20 times more than a print title and typically three, three to 10 times more. But the really interesting thing from our point of view was um, because it can, be, it can be a sensitive issue, I guess, in all markets, certainly in the Irish market, the main offenders in that regard were the large big five publishers, international publishers. It wasn't the local small publishers that were applying those sort of uh, price multiples. Um, but, you know, if you look at that and combine what I said a moment ago about the percentage of, for example, my budget that the uh, e-resource array take up, it's really the unsustainability piece. That's where that comes in. You know, no, no other part of the economy or no other part of our budget or no other part of our institutional's budget or income is growing at that kind of rate. So something is going to have to give and there's going to be some very difficult choices made either in terms of, um, and I guess this might uh, lead into what Mikhail wants to you know, we'll talk about, either in terms of having to cut back a, a provision, um, but um, as Caroline and others have said, I mean, that's a key role, particularly in, in academic lives of what we do and it's what students expect us to do. We provide the, the resources necessary for for um, for their studies or um we, you know, have to find the money from somewhere else, but that will be at the very severe um, expense in terms of loss of ability to do other things, which are very, very important and important in all as ebooks are. Uh, when it gets that level, then there's, there's another unsustainability question because there are lots of other things we're supposed to do, particularly my public library colleagues, that they're supposed to do with their budgets. It isn't, it can't just be about um, the phrase I use a lot, putting money into the ebook furnace. <laughs> And and I suppose that analogy is again goes back to the 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 challenge that it po it po it poses for libraries that 
you know, you are putting money into a furnace for which very often X years later, you have nothing to show because you, you know, you don't have permanent access to, to those titles. So you're sort of reinvesting constantly in a library which does not stand stand the test of time. Mikkel, when you gave your presentation in, in Dublin, are you you were making some pretty um interesting comments about where this is taking the Danish public library budget. I hope you remember what I'm referring to. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 referring to the the the, the threats of uh, parasitoidism, I think or... so. Yes, it was. It was. Right. Yes, Carol's yes, nodding. We... <laughs> I, I just remember a a graph that that went very rapidly upward. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's going to be at some point intersected by the graph of uh, physical acquisitions going downwards. Um, now, when we look at when we look at the, where our, our development is going, and and we put in trend lines um it, it's very ob obvious that already um the willingness of our publishers to uh to make ebooks and audiobooks available to uh, library public is not the issue anymore the the ability to pay for it uh for the public libraries is the issue that's what's actually holding us back uh quote unquote because it's still going pretty rapidly upwards and if i mean and it's just Every public library I know of include their digital loans in their in their in their updates now to politicians and funders, uh, and so we become dependent um, on our digital loans. And the image I've been using, along with my good colleague Luke Swarthout of of uh, New York Public Library, is is that of a parasite. So you get infected with this parasite, and you become dependent on it, uh, but it just grows and grows and grows. And there is a biological strategy um, uh, uh, used by some parasites is that they will use up their host and they will leave them and they will die. Uh, and if something has to stop this development, we don't, we're not getting any more funding. So it's, there's only the physical library to pay for this. So if we double or we quadruple uh, these, these, these loans and what is left is the empty husk of what used to be the physical public library, is that, is that what winning looks like? I'm not sure, I, I'm really not sure. So something has to rein in this this development. So, so contrary to our friends in the academic library, we are having almost too much success, and we're trying to figure out how to uh, how to dampen it a bit. I, I've now got images of sort of invasion of the body snatchers. No, no, no. You should you should think about what happened to John Hurt in the Alien movie. <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, invasion of the body snatchers. The publishers have come and taken over, and look, look, looks like a library. So it feels some somewhat. What, whatever works for you, Ben, in order to <laughs> <laughs> to really remember what I'm trying I'll, to say. I'll work on the alien thing a bit, a bit more. Caroline, you you you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say that you know I think for me one of the the things that I struggle with, particularly with the the kind of pricing side of things, is is you know the argument that we often hear to kind of justify the the you know ex excessive pricing of, of many kind of academic ebooks is you know this argument about kind of lost sales, for example, you know that if the library is is providing you know resources to all students, students are not buying their own copies. Um, we often hear the argument that you know an ebook won't wear out, whereas print copies obviously will and will therefore need to be replaced. But you know the frustrating thing is that alongside that, we often get the argument from publishers that you know the high prices reflect the investment that goes into textbooks, the fact that textbooks need to be constantly updated. So we're getting this argument that on the one hand, ebooks don't wear out and, and print books do, and therefore we have to charge more for it. But then on the other hand, they're also admitting that there'll be a new textbook next year and there'll be a new textbook the year after that. And so our ebooks and our, well, our print books don't even get the chance to wear out. You know, as an academic librarian, you know, I'm constantly reading the print collection, you know, old textbooks, there's a new edition, so we get rid of the old textbooks. So this argument that the ebooks, you know, are kind of making up for the fact that, that you know, the, they don't wear out, I just don't think holds true when you apply it to things like textbooks where you know we can pay 16,000 pounds for a textbook and effectively we might only be using it for a single year because next year there's another version of that textbook and we have to have these most up to date versions so i think publishers in their arguments are often trying to have their cake and eat it where they're saying oh well the ebook won't wear out but on the other hand we're not going to give you a chance for that ebook to wear out because hey there's a new edition and you're going to have to have it 
So I, I think that is really frustrating when when the argument that, that they are using to kind of justify these high prices is, is being undermined by their own actions in there being a new textbook every year. Um, and, you know, for, for universities particularly, you know, the subjects that I look after, like law, for example, you have to have the most up to date textbooks. You can't be teaching students on out of date material. You know, if you're teaching medicine, if you're teaching law, you've got to stay up to date, which means you've got to be constantly replacing these books. And I mean, with the print books, quite often when I was doing um, weeding, um, you know, some of these print books would be in pristine condition. They would have probably only had the chance to go out one or two times before there was a whole new edition coming along. So I, I think it's a bit of a disingenuous argument that we often hear about kind of lost sales and, oh, well, the digital doesn't wear out. Um, because the reality of academic publishing is that there's always a new edition, you know, 12 to 18 months down the line anyway. And then we're going to have to get that as well. So you know, the, the high prices don't really always kind of justify the, the, the excuses that we hear. Dave, um, I don't, I'm not aware of any study, and, and I've looked for these studies that, that kind of compare co production and distribution costs of paper versus digital. But as a, as a former publisher, my gut tells me that you, the 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 costs of producing and distributing e are significantly lower than than paper. If anyone is aware of a study, uh, please pop it in 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 the chat. So let's work off that premise. Let's say uh, certainly budgets are going up. Libraries are spending more on purchasing content. Probably the the distribution costs have have dropped somewhat significantly. Are, are are authors who are the font of the knowledge are they are they seeing the benefits from from the larger profits from that that we assume are are almost inevitably taking place from this uh i was trying not to laugh um no <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not um and and i think that that highlights you know what's going on here which is um there's more and more money being poured into uh this kind of system but it's not making its way back out the the other end to the creators what's getting what's happening is it's getting trapped uh with what is increasingly looking like a kind of oligopoly situation you have a handful of very very large publishers um that are uh, scooping up that excess profit um, in terms of costs, uh, you know, I, I have not found a study um, directly on production costs for digital versus print. In the U.S., there was a study sponsored by um, or conducted by uh, Ithaca uh, that looked across university press publishers um, and trying to understand, like, what are the costs behind um, producing a university press publication? Um, and the largest cost by far was acquisition costs. Um, and those are common across both digital and print publications. Um, but the, the rest of it was sort of, you know, minor details in terms of output costs. And so I, I don't think it's really credible to argue that um, there's a, certainly that there's a heightened cost. And, you know, from the publishers that I've spoken with, it seems to me like, um, they actually have lower uh, production costs if they're doing a book that's solely um, electronic, which is, for most of the ones that I've worked with, actually pretty rare. Um, most of the time they're doing uh, both a print publication and an electronic publication and trying to, you know, push out in both of those directions. So in, in, in Europe uh, and, and Canada, of course, um, and I'm sure in other countries, we have the the PLR payments, um, which essentially are, are is is funding coming from government for loans in in libraries, which most EU member states um, only assign that money to 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 loans from public libraries. So, in in the paper world, you have this how can I put it the stream of monies that flow to to authors via publishers that come from the sale of the book to members of the public and the library of course and then you have this this flow of money coming from loans and what what has what has sort of happened in the digital world is essentially authors have chosen 
not 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 that it's necessarily a free choice but authors have sort of chosen not to re rely on what copyright law gives which is the public lending right you know the the the, the royalty from the sale um but kind of but actually put their eggs in one basket, which is licensing and kind of contracts. So they are entirely beholden on the contractual terms that they agree with publishers. And as we all know, in, in legal language, these are called contracts of adhesion. You know, unless you're a very, 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 very famous author, you really don't have much say in your, your publisher contract. Um, and I, I think there's a... Well, I, I think there is a job to do from the library side, because no one else is going to do it, to say, actually, authors, you know, the bargain around paper lending, which means that you get uh, low money for the lending, is a stream that actually studies, a, a Dutch study of uh, three, four years ago shows isn't a stream of money that, that, that authors seem to be getting anymore. This Dutch study showed... I'm wanting to say either a majority or something like 30 to 40 percent of authors receiving no money for ebook loans coming coming from um uh, coming from libraries and I just sort of wonder if you've got any thoughts about how can I put it what why authors have chosen contracts over over copyright and and PLR payments I suppose which you know, if you're a big author, you probably don't care about, but friends of mine that write really love their PLR payments. Um, I can respond to that if you'd like, and then yeah. uh, others jump in. But I think one of the big issues, um, at least for academic authors, is uh, they don't really have a choice uh, of, you know, what they're able to negotiate, uh, with publishers and how to push their books in one direction or another. Um, and increasingly, uh, like I mentioned before, like we, we have far fewer publishers really operating in the space. We have some, some sort of startup interesting options along the edges. Uh, but for most academics, they're in an environment where, um, they really need to publish with, uh, you know, a handful of the major publishers for their career, um, for promotion and tenure. And uh, so negotiating on those kind of points uh, can be very, very difficult. Uh, and then I think the other point is um, they, they just don't understand it. Uh, they, they don't have anyone sort of helping them through that negotiating process. You know, most of those authors will do maybe two or three book contracts ever in their life. Uh, and their publishers are doing two or three a week. And so they know all of the points where they're gonna negotiate in, in the publisher's favor and the authors just don't have that context. That's a really um, soft spot, I think, that needs to be addressed. It's something actually for Authors Alliance, I think we're gonna work on a project this coming year to sort of help um, equip authors with more information and better negotiating resources to help them at least a little bit through that process. Thanks, Dave. Mikkel, I don't know if it's your hand up from before or? No, you know, it's it's new. Um, yeah, I wanted to say that that authors and libraries um, uh, have always loved each other, uh, public libraries at least, and, um, and digital lending has sort of driven a, a little bit of a wedge in there um because i speak to a lot of authors who are desperate because they get like 10 cents or 15 cents or whatever on a digital loan and and i can always say well well we're we're paying one point for one one euro and 50 so um maybe you should you should go talk to your publisher maybe look at your contract again but that it's 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 not our fight because we deal with the publishers they have the rights we buy the books for them they would mm -hmm. um I, I feel I, I think be a little bit suspicious if we started doing uh, guerrilla work with uh, with the authors um but but something is being something is being given away here right? and um but but then if you if you ran Ben when you retire from all this you run a furniture store instead and some poor carpenter comes in and say this chair you're selling for a thousand euros I only get 50 euros every time you sell one then what would you say? You would say something like, "I, it's, it's not really my problem, but maybe you should go and look at the contract you have with the factory. Uh, and it, 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 it's horrible. But I mean, 
I don't know. Yeah, get in touch with the with the with the waters um, associations, and um, yeah, I'm not sure. Carolina, is that a, is that a new hand or is that? Oh, sorry, that's a legacy hand. <laughs> a legacy hand. So, um, so just just sort of summing up what we've we've heard so far. So, we have issues around, I think, cost. We have issues around essentially collection development that we spend a lot of money buying collections which evaporate in a in a puff of smoke um i'm not sure if we've touched on we have touched on refusal to actually sell license to libraries which is uh very common particularly in uh english language markets we we've had the wiley for all which i'm sure many people are aware of um, where they've stopped selling uh, titles to libraries almost overnight. In, I think in the US is slightly different, but in the UK, for example, Hachette refuses to license eBooks outright to public libraries. And then we we also have have bundling of titles where libraries cannot acquire in in individual titles. And then from the author perspective. Um, clearly refusal to license and inability to purchase impacts on their ability to to reach an audience and i think it you know it certainly seems that uh money doesn't filter through necessarily in the way that it's guaranteed when those loans are based in in copyright law because of of plr um so i guess for the for the rest of the se the session i'd like to I suppose tease out some of those issues a bit more, but also focus more on kind of solutions. And I and I think I think the solutions are. I'm not sure I agree with Mikkel that there is a very big difference between ebook issues between public libraries and and academic libraries. There clearly is, but um, I think the solutions feel to me rather ra rather different in in many instances. So, um, I guess one obvious solution is if you look at Ubiquity Press, an open access publisher, you can buy the creation of a, a new book for something like 7,000 euros. Uh, and then that will go under an open license if you so choose that all libraries can then benefit from. And there's been a lot of, from the funders, a lot of focus on academic articles and funding. And I know it's changing regarding monographs, but it, you know, 7,000 euros to create a book which you can hold in perpetuity as can any library seems a relative bargain. So I think open access is clearly one solution. I'd, I'd like to sort of put it out to the floor. How do we uh, how do we think about solving this other than sort of and and yeah, how do we think about solving this regulation? talking to publishers, which libraries have done for decades. How, how do we improve the, I think, what we've established are very poorly functioning markets for libraries, researchers, our institutions and authors? Caroline. Well, I think, you know, my approach to this, and, and, and this is very much the kind of approach of ebook SOS, is that we, we need to kind of tackle this on a, on a multitude of fronts, really. And there certainly isn't one solution. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, with ebook SOS, what we've been trying to do at the moment is kind of raise awareness of the issue. But I think, you know, we need copyright reform. I think this is a, a huge element um, of the problem. You know, we have copyright laws that are trying to function in a digital space that were designed for an analog age that are, are sort of governing the way we use materials in a way that the, the legislation was never designed for. Um, I think library legislation needs updating. Um, I know various states in America, for example, have tried to do, introduce legislation um, requiring publishers to sell to libraries at reasonable rates. Um, I think that needs revisiting. I think, you know, we need author awareness um, on a much greater level. Um, you know, certainly in, in my own kind of sphere in academia, I know a lot of academics that don't think about 
the ebook access. They, you know, they just assume it'll happen, um, but they don't think about who they're publishing with. They don't think about how people are going to access that. Um, I've run into numerous occasions where the library cannot provide books that our own academics have written. Um, and when they complain to me about that, I'm like, you sign the contract, <laughs> you know, there's not a lot I can do after the fact. So we need to be educating authors up front about what rights they have, what rights they're signing away. Um, I think collectively, um, you know, in my experience from the, the academic sector, I think we need to be engaging in more collective action um, with ebooks the way we do with journals, for example. I think we need to be working with consortia more um, to try and kind of, you know, harness that collective action because that's one of the big challenges you know the sector kind of organ um, organizes um you know sort of collective agreements for things like journal packages you know the negotiations with elsevier and springer that doesn't happen with ebooks because universities obviously just sort of pick and choose titles on a very very individual basis um but i think you know we need to be looking at more of those kind of collective agreements um I, you know so i think there's a a multitude of different sort of you know fires that we can be tackling there but i think something else that's really important to remember is that this issue of of books and corporations and exploitative licenses and money not going back to the, the creators is something that we don't just see in the book industry you know it's something that we see in film it's something that we see in media it's something that we see in music um you know that these massive corporations kind of exploit their size in squeezing the market every which way so consumers are being exploited but the, the creators are being exploited you know we talk about how authors don't get remuneration unless they're really big names this is exactly the same thing that the music industry is facing you know your, your beyonce's and so on get mega bucks but your average sort of musician is not getting very much doesn't get very much from spotify and any of these kind of deals um, you know, actors, people who work in film and media, you know, unless you're a big name, there's not a lot of money in those fields. Um, and the, the corporations are making mega bucks. So I think, you know, it, it is this problem with culture as a whole, that cult culture has been co-opted by corporations and capitalism. Um, and I think the, the ebook problem is just a part of this much, much wider problem. Um, and that is something that I can't fix, you can't fix, probably all of our collective action can't fix. And that is why we need governments to be taking far more action, you know, on the size of these corporations and these monopolies that are, you know, controlling um, society. And, you know, you only have to see the impact that that can have with the Twitter meltdown at the moment. You know, one man can suddenly have an enormous impact across the whole globe. You know, corporations get to decide what we have access to. They, they get to decide how we access our culture. You know, the, there was a thing a few months ago with HBO Max, just removing things, you know, removing television programs, removing and, and even the creators can't access it. You know, if these massive companies decide there's no profit in this this content that they own anymore, it can just disappear because no one can curate it. No one can collect it. No one can preserve it. It's just entirely at the whim of these corporations. And I think that is the big issue um, that needs to be tackled. Um, and, and that's why I think we need to be kind of pitching at, at the macro level and the micro level with our solutions and, and thinking in a very broad way about how we tackle all of these various problems, because it's, it's all so interconnected. I, I guess on I should do a little informa informational to what um, Caroline just said there. If, if you're interested in, you know, this isn't, as she said, just an issue for 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 libraries and ebooks um it, it's something that we see across the film industry and the music industry so if this is something you're interested in i would recommend the book choke point capitalism by Corey doltro and rebecca giblin um on on this topic cahill thanks ben yeah um i suppose before i, I talk a, a bit a bit more about where i think there might be some you know potential solutions and what i can do about it i just want to jump back to an issue you raised there about you know ubiquity and so on i think there are similarities between the, the open access journals and books but there are also quite a lot of differences i mean some of the similarities i think there are issues around quality concerns you know i'm not just saying they're true but they're an issue there and dave mentioned earlier how important publishing with certain publishers in academia is in regards to promotion and so on and most academics don't make money uh, by publishing by you know true sales it's true the promotion they get as, as a result of of writing the book um but i think there's a particular issue with the disciplines that for whom monographs are more important than for example journal articles there's some there's some important differences there and then also think against uh, again around the nature of the content as caroline alluded to earlier the you know it's it, the 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 um 
journal articles tend to be written for experts by experts, and they already actually had lots of informal ways of getting that content to each other. Um, that's not the case in relation to textbooks. I think that's another reason why they don't quite map on as easily as uh, as you might expect at a kind of a, uh, at one level. Um, I guess in terms of, you know, what can be done about it? I mean, I think there's kind of two areas we like to focus on. First of all, is identifying the kind of key actors. And the second one then is sort of, well, what can we do about it? And I suppose in terms of the key actors, there's at least five. I mean, the publishers themselves, I actually think they're going to be really important. I mean, a lot of what they do is really, really good. They're very good at it. They have a lot of experience doing it. Um, but they simply charge too much money for their services and they put too much restrictions on then on, on, on what they produce. So I think, you know, if we could, make headway with them, then they would, that would offer an awful lot of potential. And with and they're the areas we should focus on. Second, obviously, the big area is the whole area of, be it policymakers, funders, or institutions, depending on, on where you sit, you know, alerting them, as Caroline said, to the need for legislative change, copyright reform, and so on. That's going to be essential uh, to really make, uh, I think, sustainable progress. Uh, and then also, and kind of maybe, um, obviously, given we're all here, librarians, you know, and we can't take that for granted. I mean, just two recent examples of that. Um, Last week, myself and Mikel were speaking to uh, at the public uh, libraries conference in Ireland, and um, and a lot of the feedback we got from the librarians was they weren't aware this was an issue, you know, because they're so busy doing lots of other things, they weren't aware of this, so they actually found it very very useful. And also quite recently, and kind of shockingly, when we were involved in the Wiley campaign and the and the uh, Library Association of Ireland issued our statement, we got messages from America all around the world saying we didn't know why that content had been removed. Thank you for highlighting this. And now we understand. So you know, they didn't know uh, what was happening. So I think sometimes people assume that um, all librarians know about this and they don't. So they have a very important role to play as well. But of course, crucially, authors and readers are really, really important. Uh, and ebook SOS, someone said it, there's a question, I think, there. You know, the ebook SOS have a great guide um, for, uh, for authors uh, in relation to um, how they can make better choices, I guess, and more informed choices about who, who they publish with and how they publish with. But then also readers. It's really, really important. That's what we've been trying to do in Ireland. I know uh, they've been doing it in, in the UK as well to try and get the message out to the main mainstream media to educate readers they you know quite often they think it's 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 some fail on the library's part if, if a book isn't available and uh, they don't understand all that goes on in the background in terms of the lack of access the cost and the licensing and so on and then what we're trying to do with those different those different audiences i guess as i mentioned earlier education awareness is a massive part advocacy um really really important uh, about why those issues are important and then to focus as carolyn said on you know, there's not going to be one silver bullet here. I, I think the publishers have an important part to play, but so do things like open educational resources. And then, despite what I said earlier, things like open access publishing, you know, I think it'll be slower burner for the reasons I outlined in, in relation to books, but I think they have, it has huge potential, um, particularly in, in academia. But the most important thing I wanted to say, really, about this, um, Ben, is I would ask our colleagues both um, directly involved and, and externally, I think patience is going to be important. This is going to be a long burner. Uh, you're dealing with multi-billion dollar corporations who are doing very well out of the current status quo. So it's not going to change easily or quickly. Um, and it, I mean, that's not to say we shouldn't do this. That's absolutely important we do. And the sooner we start, the better. And that's why it's so important that we are doing about it. But I I, I mean, I remember kind of almost frastically about six months into the ebook SOS campaign, myself and Johanna that met, unfortunately, virtually in a virtual conference with, with a delegate. And he said, come on, you've been at this for six months. What have you done about it? <laughs> you know, you know? <laughs> so I just, you know, and I understand yeah. that frustration because, you know, people's budgets now are under pressure and people are upset now that they can't provide titles yeah. and provide access. But, you know, they, you know, it, it, because of those forces, it is going to, it's, it, this is a complex issue and it is going to take time. Um, a couple of things. So first of all, I have to say uh, to everybody listening, the Library Association of Ireland has been absolutely exemplary as a library association highlighting to its members uh, the issues, but also highlighting to the public through, I know, Cahill, you've been on the radio. Um, I'm not sure if you've been on television, maybe you have on, on this, but you've also been in the national newspapers. So uh, the Library Association of Ireland has been exemplary in terms of community-faced activities, but also government affairs and, and and advocacy which I think you know must be recognized um of course we have an awful lot to to thank uh Caroline and Johanna who I'm hoping's on the chat I'm not sure if she is um I mean you've you you've also been um 
talking to the competition authorities in 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 the UK and Knowledge Rights Twenty One certainly will uh, be having conversations uh, with DG Competition. Um, and I suppose in terms of yes, I absolutely agree. It's a it's a long haul. We are expecting some probably Q1 next year, uh, a, a, a tender coming from the Commission for research, more research in and around ebooks to understand, um, really because the European Court of Justice made a ruling in 2016, which said that libraries should be able to buy any ebook available on the market and loan that ebook on a one copy, one user basis. But member states haven't really reacted to that so i think i think there is some some sort of movement certainly at the european level um from 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 a copyright perspective but you know potentially as we've seen with ebook sos from a competition uh angle as well but yeah i think i think we're sort of we know where the foothold the foothills are really in the ebook in the ebook campaign um i'm not even sure we're really in 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 the foothills yet, yet but i absolutely agree with you Cahal, that it's it's going to take quite a, quite a lot of time dave from the author perspective what what do you how how do you think about solutions regulatory non regulatory um, yeah, so I think uh, I agree with everything that has just been said. I think uh, we need, um, you know, there's five or six different uh, uh, ways to get at this problem, and all of them need attention. Uh, one that I didn't hear mentioned from a regulatory perspective is um, to, to try to address this issue from a competition law uh, standpoint. Um, so there's certainly a copyright law reform issue uh, lurking around in here, but I think uh, especially from the U.S. publishing conglomerate uh, side of things, uh, it, it, we really need some competition law focus from um, from from the government uh, to hone in and look at what's really going on within these markets. And I will say, uh, at least over here, I'm encouraged that uh, the current administration seemed interested in doing this and you know they they recently won a lawsuit um blocking the penguin random house simon schuster merger which was a pretty big deal uh and um i have heard other um instances of interest in in the broader publishing market so that's good um and i think is important um the other uh a few folks had mentioned um the need to um, kind of bring bring authors together uh, and get these issues in front of them. Um, and I was just looking in the Q and A here about uh, a lot of comments of how can we even get this in front of authors at the right moment? Um, you know, librarians are not there at that point of negotiation. Usually, it's like you hear about it later when there's a problem. Um, and I, I think that that's an issue where there's really a communication and publicity campaign um, that uh, needs um, uh, some attention uh, and some help, like particularly for academic authors on campus. I think um, if there's a feeling that there are resources for those authors to go to for help, um, you know, a number of universities have set up scholarly communications offices. Uh, that kind of resource can really help um and uh equipping those offices you know with uh model contract language and negotiating strategies and things like that i think can be um effective so uh so that's the one additional piece i think that's in here that um that we ought to uh keep close eyes on um and then you know one final thing um in the us uh over the last I don't know, five years or so, we've had uh, a increasingly emboldened um, group of libraries, not all libraries, but an, a, a large enough group that has been willing to challenge the uh, status quo and uh, and take some risk in doing so. So you may have, uh, you're, you may be aware of like the Internet Archive, uh, which is embroiled right now in the midst of a pretty big lawsuit. Uh, primarily focused on whether the concept of controlled digital lending uh, is legal under U.S. law. And there are a number of other libraries that are doing that now. Um, and so 
I, I do think that there is some room for libraries to take on some risk uh, and um, assert the rights that they believe that they reasonably could have under current law uh, to, to, um, to, to lend books out on a more equitable basis online. Um, and in the US that has been mostly focused on fair use and controlled digital lending. And um, I, I, I guess I should disclose, like I was the author of one of the papers that really outlined some of the legal strategy for that. So I'm particularly interested in it, but I also think that that kind of activity um, is really, really important to help push this conversation forward and, and actually effectuate some change. Thank you. Mikkel, I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, right. Um, I was thinking that um, well, in the Nabel uh, ebook working group, we've been sort of trying to distinguish between two types of problems here. One is type one problems, which is getting this provision, uh, I know the, the acquisition, just getting hold of digital titles and type two problems uh, are the ones you get once you get hold of them. Uh, what does that do to the library? What does it do to your services? What does it do to the profession? When, when up to, at least in Denmark, 40% of the library users are, are, are strictly digital users, what happens then? Uh, and, and this is why we can't actually compare public and, and, and academic libraries uh, to this extent, because academic libraries are so embroiled in, in type one problems and just getting hold of, of, of the books. Um, but I think um, in, in terms of advocacy and, 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 and activism almost, uh, the biggest group by far are the readers, uh, uh, many more readers than there are authors and librarians. So um, I, I think we should try and, and, uh, and, and subscribe. No, not, no it, was, it was not conscribe, I think is the word, um, readers uh, to the cause because also because legislators kind of expect us to to complain about things so uh, li librarians complaining about this or that is is not new to them nor our authors mm -hmm. complaints i'm sorry <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh, but but readers is a much larger group and and if readers uh, or students um started started coming up with these messages why on earth i pay my taxes i, I pay tuition so why can't i read this book this is crazy it's right there it's an ebook i can buy it uh, I think that would be a lot more effective. I do, sadly, I don't have a battle plan ready, but um, yeah, I think that would be effective. Uh, thank you. I'm just, I'm just now sort of trying to look at the comments, Stephen. I don't know. Are there any? If you, Stephen, are there any that you you you've been monitoring the questions? Are there anything that you'd like to tease out? Yeah, so I, I think one of the interesting areas was, and I think we've touched on it a little bit about the who we want to focus on, but I think sharing, I don't know, <laughs> my interpretation of some of the points, there's almost an interest in, well, what can we practically do? What is it, what, what can librarians who are experiencing these issues practically do even in the short term in order to support advocacy efforts around here? Um, I think there's also, there's some questions about working together and, 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 I think even digging down on what may be possible at the European level. So I think some of those practical points, especially given that we have so much experience from the ebook SOS campaign in the room, what actually hurt, what actually helps in the short term and what can people actually do coming out of this webinar? I, th I suppose my kind of anecdotal observation from being a former publisher, being in charge at the British Library of licensing for journals is, you know, libraries and consortia asking publishers to be nice to them and uh, license in an affordable manner it, using terms and conditions that favour the activities that educational establishments and public libraries partake in only takes you so far. Um, and, and, and therefore, of course, I don't think anyone would 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 say don't talk to publishers. But I think I think we have to recognise that that will only take you so far. Um, I like the idea of of uh, who's I think Mickle's idea about new voices, the members of the public, <laughs> um, actually raising these issues again. I think with policymakers. I think I think from my my perspective and perhaps knowledge rights 21 perspective we 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 see 
actually engage in conversations with policymakers as as being a very important um, strand in this conversation, uh, because at the end of the day, part of the reason that we're in the problems that we're, that we're in are because the legislator has, in the digital world, stepped back access to knowledge, the norms of, of libraries and students and research used to be the responsibility of government. And since we've moved into a world regulated by private contracts, the privatisation of the law, as Dave said, um, governments have said, oh, you know, we'll, we'll leave it to the free market. So it, it definitely feels to me that one thing individual librarians could do right to their MP, Library associations need to invest, I think, in the way that the publishing industry does in 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 kind of government affairs. Uh, we need those conversations with with uh, I think readers, users, and we need those conversations with with authors as well. Um, I don't. Does does anyone? So it seems we've sort of got a multi pronged legislative negotiation government affairs sort of uh, di different strands. I can see some hands going up. Cahill. Yeah, well, just to, I guess to pick up with some more kind of detailed and maybe practical points that we've certainly discovered in our, you know, in our, during our efforts is that, it, for example, um, involving students is really, really important um, because, uh, for example, the press like to hear from students. They're much more interesting to Mikhail's point than librarians. And particularly, um, uh, when we did some press there in uh, at the start of the academic year this year, so around September, October, obviously at the time and still ongoing, there was the very, very difficult um, cost of living crisis and all those associated issues. And while the ebooks issue for mainstream press can be a bit anorakty, if it's in the context of the final straw that might break the camel's back, if that phrase travels, you know, the final, you know, difficulty students can face it. So accommodation is ridiculously expensive. Um, they have um, all sorts of other costs associated with going to college. And, you know, if then on top of all that, the uh, libraries are unable to provide them with the content they would expect to get as part of their student life. Well, then the idea they could be expected to buy it was just kind of that bridge too far. So that, you know, that's really, really important. And I guess that would extend as well uh, to Mikel's point in terms of citizens and readers, in terms of public libraries. I mean, uh, on two occasions during COVID, very generously, and we're very glad they did it, our government uh, made additional resources available for the purchase of ebooks by the uh, National Public Library System, and that was great. Um, but, um, you know, going back to the furnace analogy, I dread to think how quickly that money was used up. And yet, you know, an, an on we go type thing. And I think if, you know, if readers were to highlight those issues to their politicians, well, then ultimately that's going to be very powerful because at the end of the day, obviously votes are important and citizens vote more than librarians and so on. So, you know, I, I suppose it's, in, in, it's an extrapolation of that student argument. So that's something. But also, I mean, and what holds me to say as president of the Library Association of Ireland, you know, um, get involved with your library association locally. And um, and if and if your library association isn't part of a wider alliance internationally around this issue, well, I would ask the question: Why isn't it? Because the one thing that we have learned through our last couple of years of being involved is this is an international issue, and that can actually be quite comforting because, again, you know, in the way that sometimes readers think it's a failure on individual libraries' part not mm. to be able to provide a title, um, something like you know, well, are the Irish librarians not good negotiators, or they're not doing a good job? And then you talk to German librarians and Danish librarians and English librarians and American librarians. Uh, you know, there's issue of that, but then also crucially, especially for example, those of us um, in, uh, who are part of the EU, it's very likely the solution to these issues is going to be at that level. And therefore, the more member states, frankly, that are um, uh, jumping up and down about this issue, then the more likely that there will be that structural change is going to be necessary to really, you know, deliver sustainable progress. I, I can see in the chat from Eleanor Rowan, um, She's just highlighted a Canadian advocacy campaign that targets readers, uh, econtentforlibraries.org. So that's that's good. Caroline, I could. Yeah, I was just going to, I mean, echo a lot of the, the stuff that's already been said. I think, you know, for my sort of colleagues in the academic libra librarian sphere, you know, write to your MP, whether that is your, your personal MP where you live or, or the MP for your university, um, you know, that constituency. I think, you know, talk to academic colleagues, you know, use the ebook SOS guidance template to, to talk to them about these issues, raise awareness with these issues. 
Um, you know, if you are a librarian, talk to your library director. If you're a library director, talk to your VC, you know, make sure that the university management are aware of these issues. Um, you know, talk to your students union, get the students union involved in this, because I suspect students aren't always aware of these issues. I think that there is a lot of widespread assumptions around ebooks and digital content, um, you know, not just in universities, but, but generally people assume that everything is available as an ebook. People assume that the prices are the same that they see on Amazon Kindle prices. Um, and I think, you know, making people aware of these issues, um, you know, talking to academic colleagues, talking to students is one of the biggest things that we can do. Um, because it is going to be that collective pressure. Um, you know, ebook SOS has been doing what we can, but at the end of the day, we are just three librarians. We're not a registered charity. We're not an organization. It's, it's difficult to get people to pay attention to us. Um, so we need to harness those kind of recognized organizations that are out there. Um, you know, getting more universities sort of collectively on board, I think is, is hugely important. And that's something that the individual librarians can work towards in their own institutions. You know, I think it is going to be collective pressure that gets us anywhere in the end. Um, I, I, I guess we're we're very sort of conscious. Obviously, individual librarians can write to their own members of parliament, or or indeed most parliaments, I'm sure, will have an education or a culture committee. Um, in the UK, for example, we've got a new chair of the education committee. So if we've got anyone from the University of Worcester, please write to your MP because he's he's the chair. He, you know, individual letters do, especially if they have facts and figures in, do stand the chance of, I think, being properly evaluated by policymakers. Mikkel. Yeah, I wanted to add that um, one of the advantages of, 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 at least in Denmark, the, the public library platform having captured a, a big part of the market, 28% of the trade market, to be precise, is that we can throw our weight around a little bit. And so mm -hmm. we've been able to negotiate prices down for the last uh, many years, which is good. That's my day job. So that's good. But um, solving the issue by by making more money available for it, as as Carl said, is just strikes me as horrific because it's only going to embolden the the people who are making too much money off of this. And it it strikes me as if the problem was that that students were being mugged uh, on the street, then giving them more money to carry around so maybe they could survive more muggings or have something <laughs> have something after the muggings is no 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 stop that no no that's not yeah let's not go there <laughs> i think we did though um dave i don't have you any do you want to add anything on sort of next policy steps individual collectively i i think i i would as knowledge rights 21 while dave's thinking whether he wants to add any more just like to add in a few things we've put into the chat i can see there uh knowledge rights 21 has uh an ebook position statement which i think reflects the discussion on the panel that there is no one size fit all fits all it's a mix of copyright law reform um as well as 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 open access i think um and I think one thing that we will be doing in the new year is coming up with sort of model terms and conditions and 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 so produce something which we will put on the website from a library perspective, which says, you know, the following terms and conditions are I, the ideal terms and conditions that that libraries would like um, when licensing ebooks. So sort of a, a practical licensing based strategy is something that I think we will launch in, in the new year. Dave, I don't know if, if there's. Um, yeah, you know, I think a couple of things. One um, is the certainly collective action, I think, at the legislative level, but even uh, kind of out more publicly, um, this last um, major sort of dust up with Wiley and the 1300 ebooks that they removed, I think was a really good lesson in what happens when you have a number of uh, constituencies speaking up, you know, there was the library community um, led really by ebooks, uh, ebook SOS, um, kind of speaking out and then uh, um, consortia speaking out, but then um, we also had authors involved um, and jumping in and contributing to uh, communication there. And I think that 
you know, rounding those folks up and highlighting when there are particular issues and, and um, uh, getting that out into the public is really, really important. Um, the other thing, you know, if there's any folks from foundations or civil society organizations on the call, uh, I also think that it's incredibly important uh, to help support libraries um, and, uh, and efforts like ebook SOS and uh, Knowledge 21, uh, Knowledge Rights 21 to, uh, to do this work. Um, you know, when you're talking about collective action and trying to negotiate sort of at the legislative level, uh, my experience uh, is there's a handful of groups like Authors Alliance and we show up and we've got like a couple of lawyers um, like me, I'm a, I show up. And then there's like 12 people on the other side of the room um, presenting the view of publishers and the big content industry interests and it, it's just you know effectively impossible to um, present your arguments in a really compelling way uh, and deal with all of the different counter arguments without adequate support for that. And so I think that's really important. I, I'm really encouraged that you know Arcadia is uh, funding some of the work that um, Ben that you're doing and some of the other work in the EU. But um, to you know it, if folks care about this issue, if they think that it's important that the public be able to read books online, um, which seems like a pretty fundamentally important thing. Uh, I think continued support for advocacy efforts is really critical. We're all sort of operating, I think we acknowledge on a, on a shoestring here um, and are happy to do it because it's an important issue, but uh, that, that I think has to be part of the equation. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, it's, difficult and people could challenge us saying well you would say that anyway but you know let's forget that there probably isn't a piece of scientific research on the planet that takes place without the underpinning of a library um you know the 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 way that access to knowledge has been regulated primarily through copyright law has has guaranteed some forms of of access over the 19th and 20th century it's created de facto rights that allow um acquisition that allow lending and and the legislator has since the advent of digital stepped back and left knowledge regulation entirely to the private sector and i i you know i would as we've been doing urge every individual on on this call to raise this with their mp with the with the institution that they work um and and feel sort of empowered to to because you know the stakes are large the 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 stakes are you know personal enjoyment equality of access and and scientific advancement you know the, those are pretty big <laughs> factors as far as I'm concerned so we've we've hit the one and a half hour mark we've only lost about 15 percent over over the call which I think is is pretty good um so first of all I would like to say thank you very very much indeed to the dream team for your pearls of of wisdom over the last one and a half hours we will um, also, quick infomercial, sign the academic ebook campaign, open letter that is open internationally. Um, if you, from, from which is is an academic ebook investigation, Caroline. Yep, I'll pop a link in the chat. Yep, so put pop a link in 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 the chat. Uh, I've put also in the chat the. Knowledge Rights 21 ebook position statement. So please take a look at that. Obviously, follow uh, Caroline, Cahal, Mickle, Authors Alliance on online and, and, and learn more if you're interested. And we will put this recording on the website, I think, probably next week. So um, I think with that, we are probably all done. So again, thank you very, very much to. Um, our speakers for such a fascinating and wide-ranging insight in, into the many issues that ebooks present. So thank you. No, well, thanks for organizing, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know, speakers, do you want to just hang on? Um
if you're sure. able to and then if everyone just wait for people to So I think I think if we hit six, we know that we're alone. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe people have just gone to make a cup of tea and are aren't aren't really on on the call. I I mean I didn't really want to say anything particular. Are we still recording? So let's stop.